Good evening, everyone, on this rainy, rainy evening. Welcome to the David C. Hardesty Jr. Festival of Ideas at West Virginia University. For more than a decade, the Festival of Ideas has enriched students' education and broadened their thinking on the day's most important issues. As a WVU student leader in the 1960s, David Hardesty organized the first Festival of Ideas. Nearly 30 years later, he returned to his alma mater as its university president, and in 1997, relaunched the festival as an annual event, drawing renowned speakers to campus every year. We are very pleased to have former President Hardesty with us here in the audience tonight. Please help me welcome him and thank him for his continued service. Thank you. Festival speakers have come to our campus from around the world, from diverse backgrounds, and right in our own backyard, featuring some of our nation's most brilliant thinkers. Following tonight's lecture, we will take questions from the audience. Please raise your hand and one of our ambassadors will come to you. Our event tonight is being webcast live at webcast.wvu.edu and will be posted online for future viewing. We also encourage you to share your thoughts via Twitter using the hashtag WVU Ideas. As we celebrate homecoming week here at West Virginia University, it is fitting that tonight we welcome back home to West Virginia, Jake Harriman, founder and CEO of Nuru International. Jake hails from the mountains of Terra Alta, Preston County, West Virginia, a graduate of Preston High School. Jake briefly attended WVU as an engineering student before being accepted to the U.S. Naval Academy, where he graduated with distinction. After the Academy, he served seven and a half years in the Marine Corps as platoon commander in both the Infantry and Special Operations Unit Force Recon. He led his Marines on four operational deployments, including two combat tours in Iraq and disaster relief operations in Indonesia and Sri Lanka following the Asian tsunami. He was awarded the Bronze Star for actions in combat during his second tour in Iraq. Following his honorable military service, Jake was accepted to the Stanford Graduate School of Business where he earned his MBA. It was during that time at Stanford that he founded Nuru International, a social venture committed to the ending of extreme poverty in remote rural areas across the globe. By focusing on the practical and mentoring local leaders on the principles of leadership, Nuru enables communities to build the human to human humanitarian programs, excuse me, and infrastructure thriving communities need. Healthcare, education, agriculture, and water sanitation all on their own. Please help me welcome Jake Harriman. Good evening. It's a pleasure for me to be here tonight. Uh, I want to thank you guys first uh, for all coming out. I think what I'd like to do tonight is, is have a discussion with you about uh, three main points. First, I want to talk about a little bit about my story and how I got here. Second, I want to engage you in a discussion about the challenge and problem of extreme poverty. And maybe we can push our thinking a little bit on that. And then finally, I want to talk to you about four key lessons that we have learned over the past five years in fighting the problem of extreme poverty from what I call the front lines of the fight. So first, I want to start with my background. That's me, the big ugly guy there in the middle. Uh, I was pretty filthy on that, on that operation. But I, uh, for those of you who know me really well, I didn't always look like that. This is what I look like at age 13. <laughs> and it's, it's OK to laugh. That's ridiculous. We all, we all come from somewhere, right? I grew up on a, in a little uh, town here in West Virginia. I know this is the West Virginia University, but how many are actually from West Virginia here? Great, a lot of you. How many come from a small town? Awesome. How many have heard about my small town, the Wetzel Settlement? Great, wow, that's awesome. So I grew up in uh, this little house in the Wetzel Settlement. And I learned, uh, I had a really amazing family who taught me a lot about hard work and discipline and trying your best and continuing to persevere about compassion and mercy. 
had a really great childhood. I really enjoyed growing up in the hills of West Virginia. You know, it was great because we, uh, we grew all our own food, we hunted for meat, and as you can tell again from this picture, we also cut our own hair as well. <laughs> Uh, so when I, when I, uh, uh, I went to Preston High School, played football at Preston, and decided to come to this finance institution here at, at WVU, where I studied uh, mechanical engineering for a while, and then I just got an itch, got a little bit of a bug. I wanted to travel, wanted to see the world, wanted adventure, excitement, and I didn't have any money. So I decided, uh, hey, the military sounds like a great idea. I had no idea what I was getting into at the time, but I decided to go to the Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. So I applied, got in, studied systems engineering there, and upon completion and graduation in 1998, I was commissioned as a Marine Corps officer, and I served as a both infantry and special operations platoon commander. And so I wanted to uh, start with an experience. I want to tell you a story about what happened to me in April of 2003. Many of you might remember in 2003 was the, was the Iraqi invasion. <clears throat> And uh, in April of 2003, I found myself in a fighting hole facing north along the main avenue of advance in southern Iraq during the Iraqi invasion. We were one of the leading units in the Marine Corps in the fight during those initial days, during that initial push. We had just had the first major contact in the war in a place called Nasiriyah. Some of you might remember the Battle of Nasiriyah. It was a horrible ambush. Had a, we lost several guys in the ambush. We were able to push through the city and set up a defensive position north of the city along the road. We had dug in. Southern Iraq at the time was one of the poorest, most desperate areas of the world. Uh, there was the, everyone was hungry. There was no medical services. There was no clean water, no schools for the kids. It was a horrible situation. And what had been happening at the time was as we advanced north, the Iraqi army had been retreating uh, and were, they wanted to make a final stand in Baghdad. And Saddam had been pushing his Fedayeen soldiers, the special forces guys, south into these rural villages, into these poor villages. And these guys were going hut to hut, telling these farmers, look, your, ch your children are starving right in front of you. We'll feed your kids. We'll, we'll send them to school. If you will pick up this weapon and go fight these guys 10 miles uh, south of here that you never heard of before. And we were fighting these guys by the hundreds and thousands. And so that kind of set the stage for what happened that morning when I was in my fighting hole. So I, you know, we were all, we were all scared. We'd just been ambushed. We were exhausted. We hadn't eaten in two days. We were waiting on our resupply. And I, I knew that I had to check on my guys because they were, they were terrified. So I got up out of my fighting hole and I started walking the lines. And I looked north along this highway, along Highway 7, and I saw a small white car approaching us from the north. And the, the enemy had just started a, a tactic where they would pack explosives in a car and try to run it into our position. So I grabbed three of my guys. We took off running north uh, along the highway to try to get them to stop. But the car wasn't stopping. So I fired a couple warning shots over the hood of the car. Finally, it stopped about 50 meters out. And the driver jumps out of the car, starts waving his arms frantically and running at us. So now I think this guy, is, he strapped a bomb to himself, and he's going to try to blow himself up. So I'm yelling at him in Arabic to try to get him to stop, to get on the ground. He's not stopping. So I raise my weapon. I think I'm going to have to take this guy out. And I look behind him, and I see a large black military truck roll up behind his little white car. Six guys in black jump out of the truck, run up to his car, and start shooting into the car. This guy stopped dead in his tracks started screaming, turned around and started running back to the car. And that's when I realized what had happened. This was one of those poor farmers who was trying to escape across our lines with his family. So I yelled at my guys and I told them to take the Fedayeen soldiers out as I sprinted to try to make it to save this guy's family. But by the time I got there, it was too late. His wife was in the passenger seat. She'd been shot in the face and in the chest, and she was slumped over dead. He had a baby girl in the back seat whose arm had been shot off, and she'd been shot in the head. And he was cradling the body of his little six-year-old daughter who'd been shot in the stomach, and she was choking on her own blood. 
And this guy was beside himself. In two seconds, he lost everything he had in this world. And for the first time in the war, everything slowed down for me. And I put myself in this guy's shoes. And I asked myself, you know, I live in a world of choices. What school do I want to go to? Where do I want my kids to grow up? What do I want to wear? What do I want to eat for breakfast? What were this guy's choices when he woke up this morning? He could watch his children starve to death. He could strap a bomb to himself and blow himself up, or he could make some desperate attempt to cross our lines knowing the Fed aim were right next door. And I didn't know what, I didn't know what to do. <clears throat> so I let my weapon hang at my side and I just started crying with this guy. And then I got really, really angry. It wasn't fair. It wasn't fair that just because of the GPS coordinates of this guy's birthplace, he didn't have any choices. He didn't have the choices that I grew up with, that we all share, that we all enjoy. And I had an awakening moment on that day on the battlefield that changed my life forever. I had several other experiences like that as well. Multiple times in combat. I did another tour. We were doing snatch and grab missions south of Baghdad. But I saw the same thing again and again and again. A look of absolute desperation on the faces of young men and women who would strap a bomb to themselves and come running into our position. And I began to see that many times it wasn't out of some kind of misplaced sense of hatred for the West. Many times it was out of love for that little five-year-old son and little three-year-old daughter at home that were starving to death. So I decided that perhaps, just maybe, I can make even more of an impact on the war on terror if I got out and fought what I believe to be the leading contributor to the proliferation of terrorism, insurgency, and global instability in our world today, which is extreme poverty. So I, I left the Marine Corps, I left everything that I knew, and my guys supported me. You know, my guys on my team, they saw the same thing, and they were cheering me on. They said, you know, uh, we, we want you to fight this thing. We want you to take, this, take on the base problem that is, that, is, that is causing these guys to get into these cells. And so I got out, and I, and I quickly realized um, I had no idea what I was doing, right? I mean, extreme poverty, it's a massive problem. I wasn't trained for this. I was a you know, poor kid from West Virginia who became a Marine. I, I, didn't know what, I, mean, I didn't know anything about global extreme poverty and the science behind it. I wasn't a Peace Corps guy. I wasn't a development economist. I wasn't trained for this. I was a Marine. So I dedicated about a year and a half of my life to study the problem. I wanted to research the problem of extreme poverty. What organizations are out there? What are they doing? What's working? What's not working? And why? And I began to form some ideas. And at first, I tried to get a job with some of these organizations. I thought, you know, I'll add value from within. But I quickly realized that nobody wanted to hire me. My, my resume didn't look very good for this kind of work. I was a Marine. So I thought, you know, that's fine. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll start my own thing. You know, I'm pretty entrepreneurial. My dad was pretty entrepreneurial. I, I think I had his bug. So I thought I'd just start something on my, on, on my own. But I didn't want to start something that would just be, a, you know, another little nonprofit that would have a marginal impact. Maybe I would, I would kind of waste some money, something like that. I, I wanted to build a business. I wanted to build a company that could take on extreme poverty globally and scale to have a significant impact in this fight. You see, I had left everything in the world that I knew to get into this new fight against extreme poverty, and there was no turning back. I was in 110%. So I decided to go to business school. Went to Stanford and got in by some miracle of God. And uh, it, was, it was an amazing experience because I went there with this vision to build this company, to take on extreme poverty. And I told my story, I talked to my classmates, and over 30 of my classmates wanted to get involved. They all helped me build different parts of the model, different parts of Nuru. Six faculty members at Stanford got involved, provided seed funding, help, and advice. And in two years, we raised about $450,000, put together this groundbreaking new approach to fight the problem. I graduated in June of 2008, hired a small team that I had been recruiting, and then we moved to uh, the second poorest area of all of Kenya, called the Korea District in southwest Kenya in September of that same year. 
That fall, we started with just a handful of farmers. And now, over uh, five years later, we're working with about 30,000 brave men, women, and children whose lives have been transformed and they've come out of extreme poverty in both Kenya and in Ethiopia. It's been an amazing experience, and I've learned so much along the way. So many hard lessons, good lessons and bad lessons. So now I want to talk to you a little bit about what we actually do. What does Nuru do? But before we talk about that, I want to talk about the problem. And when I challenge our thinking, as my, cha- as my thinking was also challenged about this problem of extreme poverty. So what is extreme poverty? What is the definition of extreme poverty? Well, the World Bank says that extreme poverty is those living on less than $1.25 a day. That's, the, that's what I first found when I did my research, those living on less than $1.25 a day. But you see, that's an st- extremely limiting definition. That definition didn't match up with what I had seen in combat, the desperation, the hopelessness. It didn't match up. See, this is a problem about money. The problem of extreme poverty seemed a lot more complicated to me than just money. And the solutions that I discovered in my research that were designed to meet this need didn't seem to be very lasting. I saw wells that were drilled. When I went back a year and a half later, they were broken and nobody was working on them. I saw villages where uh, rice and maize was distributed, given for free to these villages over time, year after year after year, until the farmers forgot how to farm. I saw schools and clinics that were built, only to go back two years later and see they were empty. See, this definition didn't seem like it was, it was matching up with my experiences. It didn't seem like a, a real solution, that it could be lasting. So I kept digging, and I came across the work of... Uh, of these two guys, Makbub Al-Haq and Amartya Sen. Makbub Al-Haq is a minister of finance. He was the minister of finance in Pakistan, and Amartya Sen was a Nobel Prize winning economist. You see, these guys believe that poverty is a lack of meaningful choices for basic human rights. This definition seemed a lot more powerful, a lot more along the lines of what I had seen. And to just show you a little bit of, uh, of an example, let's, let's do, a little, do a little picture here. So let's say, you got, some of you guys are college students, all right, so help me do the math here. There's about 1.4 billion people in our world today who suffer from extreme poverty. If we go with the old definition, living on less than $1.25 a day is extreme poverty. So let's take 1.4 billion people, multiply by $1.25 a day, that's about $1.75 billion. Now, to us, that sounds like a lot of money, but on a global scale, that's not that much money. In fact, it's it's less than 0.01% of the U.S. GDP. So why don't we just take a fleet of trucks like this, load them up with money, drive them around all these villages, and kick the cash out the back of those trucks, making sure all these villagers have money, right? Everybody's got their $1.25. We've solved extreme poverty. Or even better, let's, let's multiply that by 365. It's about 640 billion. Load up our trucks again. Do that every year or every day for a year. We've ended extreme poverty for an entire year. Voila, simple. We solved the problem. Well, no, that's ludicrous. It's ridiculous. Extreme poverty is a much more challenging problem than that. And once I began to, to, to work with these guys, understand the, understand the definition that they were talking about, I began to see the power in this definition. The goal in fighting the problem no longer was about how many wells can I drill, how many bags of rice can I distribute. The goal becomes to empowering individuals to be able to make choices, equipping individuals to be able to make good choices, and then providing an enabling environment where they can then act on those choices once they have made them. You see, this is a very different type of solution to go after. And once you start doing that, you start eliminating this definition on the left, and you start focusing on the definition on the right. And this is the definition that we at Nuru are committed to solving. This is the problem that we are trying to tackle with our groundbreaking new approach to fighting extreme poverty. So now I want to talk to you about these four key lessons that we have learned in the fight. When I begin to tackle this definition of extreme poverty, I begin to learn a lot in the fight from the folks that we were working with. I did all my research, 
in academia, but when I actually moved to the field, my teachers were those living in poverty themselves, living in these conditions. So I'm going to talk about these four key lessons. I'm going to focus on the last one mo the most when I get to it. So our first lesson, instead of what, instead of asking what solution should we implement, start by asking who. The true solutions to extreme poverty lie within people. You see, at Nuru, we focus on leaders. We focus on empowering leaders. The greatest lesson that I have learned in the fight against extreme poverty is that the answer lies within those trapped in poverty themselves. These are folks who are way more capable, resourceful, more intelligent than I will ever be. They have survived things in their lifetimes that me with all my special operations capable training could never survive. They're amazing individuals. And we have a lot to learn from them about the fight against extreme poverty. What we do at Nuru is we build their capacity. We give them the skills that they need to untap the potential that they already have to fight the fight. The second thing we do is we ask questions together with the local leaders around four key areas of need. We focus on hunger, inability to cope with economic shocks, preventable disease and death, and lack of quality education for children. Nuru uses an integrated approach in the fight. We don't come in with four prefabricated solutions and programs that we force feed into people and make them, make them run these programs. That doesn't work. It's not sustainable. You know, they, many of the best ideas to fight poverty, like I said, come from the communities themselves. So first thing you have to do is understand the need, which means you have to listen. You have to be willing to ask questions to understand the world that, that these folks live in first. So we ask questions about these needs together, and then we do the third step, the third thing that I, under, uh, that I learned, which is we research the best solutions out there to take on these four needs, and then we work with the local leaders to choose the ones that will work the best in their communities, in their cultural context. You see, there's a lot of good organizations out there that are already designing great solutions to meet some of those four needs. So why duplicate effort? Why try to reinvent the wheel? My team and I did a, lot, a ton of research to try to understand what's already working out there in these four areas. We package together those solutions. We bring them to the project. We work with the local leaders that, that we have begun the program with. And we wrestle with the pros and cons of all these best solutions from around the world to see which ones they think will work the best in their context. And then we let them choose the solutions that will work there. There's, a, there's way more ownership that way. You're not telling people what's best in their community. They're telling you. You're just providing a little bit of information and a catalyst. And then our fourth key learning is build a sustainability engine. OK, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this. Nuru is designed to go into communities, impoverished communities, work with the local leaders to design solutions, help them create impact in their communities to fight poverty, and then we leave after seven years, leaving behind a completely self-sustaining, self-scaling program that eventually impacts the entire nation. You see, we believe we have to leave. We believe Westerners are not the solution, it's the local people. But you have to build a sustainability engine so that the impact that you're producing with the local leaders can last. So I want to talk a little bit about engines. First of all, um, let me ask a question. How many of you guys out there have ever worked on an engine? Oh, not that many. This is West Virginia. Come on. <laughs> okay, a few of you. So I grew up working on engines. Uh, I actually don't know that much about them. My dad and my brother are much better. My brother built a CJ5 or CJ7, one of those Jeeps from scratch. It was unbelievable. The guy's a genius. My dad um, was always tinkering with the engine on our tractor. So I, I grew up learning a little bit about engines. But where I had to really learn about engines was when I met this beast. Does anybody know what this engine runs? Yeah. A Volkswagen. A Volkswagen. This was my first car, the bane of my existence. And I had to learn about engines. When I bought this thing, I had to navigate the social challenges of buying a car for $75 and trying to get from point A to point B on time. Now, this was particularly challenging 
with the logistics of a date because you'd have to leave at least a half hour early on the way to pick her up because the hoses all blow off the engine block. You have to try to figure out where they go back. And then, you know, you have to park on a hill next to the theater because you know it's not going to start when you get out of the movie so that you can drift start the thing afterwards. So I, I had to learn a lot about engines, you know, when I, um, when I was growing up in college. But why all this talk about engines? So I talked about the sustainability engine. Every company and every organization runs on an engine, okay? And there are two major types of fuel that, that, that fuel a company, that fuel an engine. That's money and people. And there's two questions you have to answer when you're running a company to be successful. The first one is, where are you going to source your fuel? The second one is, how are you going to grow that supply of fuel over time to make sure the company can continue to grow? Now, the way that Nuru addresses this fuel problem is, is very different than a lot of other organizations. And uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. How many of you have heard of uh, Jeffrey Sachs and the Millennium Villages Project? Okay, there's a few of you. So you see, Sachs, he's a, he's a, Sachs is a w very famous, well-known economist. And what he has done with the Millennium Villages Project, we learned a lot from them in the beginning about pros and cons of, of the way to fight extreme poverty. But you see, the way we see this fuel problem is pretty radically different. Sachs and his team believe that the fuel needs to come from the West. That if you mobilize enough people, enough money, enough ideas from the West, and you apply them to a village context, you can defeat poverty in that village, multiply that by the number of villages in the region, and you can eliminate poverty forever in that region. You see, at Nuru, we don't believe that. We believe the opposite. We believe that the fuel has to come from the communities themselves. The fuel has to come from the people. The leaders have to come from those communities, and they have to truly own these solutions. The money has to come from local markets, local markets in that country, not from the West. When we leave our projects, our projects are completely self-sustaining. They're run by local leaders, and they're fueled by capital raised in those countries through business. So I want to talk a little bit about our sustainability engine. There's two ways we do that. We have a local, what we call a local leadership factory, and we, have, we build diversified, scalable businesses. So first, we'll focus on the leadership. I talked to you a little bit about leadership. Leadership for us is everything. It's the foundation of everything that we do. The goal of our leadership program is to equip servant leaders to be able to understand need in their community, design solutions to meet that need effectively, implement and scale those solutions, and then innovate past challenges on their own after we leave the project. And so to illustrate that, I want to tell you a quick little story about this lady here. This lady's name is Milka, and this is her farmer group that she works with. When I first met Milka, I'd just shown up uh, in the little community they call Nyamataboro Village, and I was walking around in the field meeting farmers, and I came across Milka. Milka walked right up to me, and started trying to speak in broken English. She was extremely smart. She knew way more English than I knew Swahili. She started telling me her story. She had six children. They were all hungry. She had one acre of land. She was trying to raise maize, corn, on her, on her land. She was only able to raise about, to grow about six, ba or sorry, three bags of maize each year on that one acre. Her family needed six to survive. Her children had malaria. Two of them had already died, and the rest were hungry. They couldn't go to school because she couldn't afford to send them to school. They had no disposable income. Her husband beat her horribly. She was in a terrible situation. Milka was in a situation that many of us would find completely hopeless. But this woman was not without hope. This woman was brave and resourceful. She came to me and she said, you know, through a translator, she said, you know, we need you to come in here and provide some assistance. And I'd heard that a lot in some other places. And I said, yeah, we're starting to put together this program. She goes, no, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. I need you to listen to me first. She taught me everything I know about this model that we do. She said, I need you to listen to me first. I and the other women in this community have some really good ideas about how we can change things. But I need you to listen to us, and I need you to give us a little bit of a boost beyond where we are right now. I don't want your free handouts. 
I don't want you to stay. I just want to boost. So I worked with Milka and the other farmers to start putting together a program. We gave Milka a loan for fertilizer and seed. It was one of the best practices that we had learned from another organization called One Acre Fund. We gave her a loan for fertilizer and seed. We taught her best agronomic pra uh, practices. We learned from other organizations around the world. She was able to go from three bags of maize per acre to 18 bags of maize per acre in one season. With that maize, she could feed her family. She repaid the loan. She sold the rest. She saved it in Nuru Savings Club. She was able to buy a, a bed net from the health worker, the Nuru health worker, to protect her children from malaria and send her kids to school. Milka's group saw her work ethic and her drive, and they promoted her to the group leader. The next season, she did so well, we hired her as a field officer over 50 farmers. Now, in the Korea district, Milka is over 500 farmers in the areas that we're working. And this woman is sassy. I mean, she, she is an incredible, well, I'm, I'm afraid of her. I, I, do not, I do not go against Milka. She is a firm, strong leader in her community. And there are 30,000 stories out there just like hers of brave people fighting their own situation, lifting themselves out of extreme poverty with Nuru. And that's, that's based on our leadership program. Now I want to talk about the second piece, our financial engine. Nuru builds a diversified, scalable business we call Nuru Social Enterprises that taps into local markets. Over seven years, we work with local entrepreneurs who have great ideas. We provide world-class training, business consultants to assist them, and even seed, seed capital and working capital to get those businesses off the ground. Over seven years, those businesses grow to become profitable, at which point we can then exit because that, those profits get driven back into the nonprofit side to sustain operations and then scale operations. And that's the way we're able to actually be sustainable. So Nuru is at a very, very exciting time right now. I'm so excited. I mean, I'm excited to be here because it's West Virginia. This is where I come from. But I'm also really excited right now because Nuru is about to, uh, I think it's about to explode. We're about to have groundbreaking success with, this, with a radical new model that we are piloting on the ground in Kenya now and Ethiopia. We're approaching what we call proof of concept, which is proving the model. Once we prove that this model works, we want to open source it. We want to teach governments and other organizations about how they can use this model to have dramatic transformation in, in their own countries, to have dramatic transformation in the regions other NGOs are already operating in, so that we can scale this much more quickly and we can provide more and more choices to those in need. So I get asked a lot, um, why the urgency? You know, why are you so intense? People ask me that all the time. Why are you so intense? Why are you in such a rush? These things take time. Yes, they do take time. But let me explain to you the urgency. You see, when I go to bed at night, I see the eyes of the Iraqi farmer that I met on Highway 7 every single night. That haunts me. You see, I've seen far too much unnecessary death in my life. And I want to do everything within my power to stop it. Let me give you a staggering statistic. In the 237 year history of, of America, we have lost 1.3 million brave men and women in combat, from the American Revolution all the way through the global war on terror. Well, there are more people dying from extreme poverty every single month. 1.5 million people die from extreme poverty every month. That's a ridiculous statistic. But the good news is, this is an eminently solvable problem, guys. We have the resources and the know-how in our world today to solve this problem. This does not have to stay with us. We can fix this. And there's people who are trapped in extreme poverty who are ready to work with us to fix it, to fix their own problems. But you see, I, I, think, I think we suffer from this, this problem, this challenge, not in these countries, but within our own selves in the West. You see, I've traveled a lot, and I've met a lot of organizations, and I've met a lot of good people in the fight against extreme poverty. 
But I see a problem. I see what I call a glass ceiling on extreme poverty. I see a lot of other organizations and a lot of governments fighting to see who can get as close as possible to that glass ceiling. But I see very few people who believe that you can actually break through the glass ceiling and end extreme poverty. How in the world are we going to ever solve the problem if we don't believe it can be solved? You see, when I started Nuru, I pulled together a group of people who believed that this problem can actually be solved. We can break through the glass ceiling. But it's going to take a different way of thinking. It's going to take a different approach. I believe that we are all called to get in the fight against extreme poverty. Nuru can't do this alone. Other organizations out there and governments can't do it alone. It's going to take all of us. It's going to take you getting in the fight with us. All of us have talents and skills that we've been given that we can contribute to this fight. It doesn't mean you have to go to Africa and be on the front lines of the fight. There's tons of ways to get involved. And many of you already are. And I am inspired every day by the emails and the, and the phone calls that I get the Skype calls about those of you who are already in this fight encouraging me and encouraging my team in the fight against extreme poverty. It means so much to me. You inspire me every day. But there is still work to be done. There is still work to be done. And I would say the first thing you have to do to get into the fight against extreme poverty, you have to believe. You have to believe that this can be done. As an example, I want to show you from their own mouths, some of my friends in Kenya who also believe. Nuru gave me a loan of maize seed and fertilizer, and I am working harder than ever before. I believe that with Nuru, for the first time, my children will not know a single day of hunger. Before Nuru came, I was harvesting three sacks of maize per hectare. Now I'm getting 18. After this harvest, I'll repay my agriculture loan, save some for eating, and sell the rest. With that money, I believe I'll be able to build my own house. With financial planning I received with Nuru and a small business loan, I believe I am able to send all my children to school at the same time. Even if a problem arises, I have savings I can withdraw, so we'll be all right. Each home I visit has a health care field officer. I ask questions, listen, promote health behaviors, and diagnose diseases like malaria, typhoid, and measles. I believe with Nuru, I can dramatically reduce preventable diseases and save the lives of many. I love when Nuru teachers come to my school. They make learning fun, and I'm not afraid to raise my hand or go to the blackboard. I'm learning to read and write, and I believe that with Nuru, if I continue to study, one day I can become a teacher. I've been farming with Nuru for three years, working very hard. And this year, for the first time, I didn't need to take loan of maize seed and fertilizers because I could pay myself. Now I tell my neighbors about Nuru and I believe that with Nuru, extreme poverty is not our future. All this is possible. All this is possible. All this is possible because Nuru, because Nuru. Because Nuru International believes in me. Believes in me, believes in me. Because Nuru believes in me.
I want to. Yeah, they, they deserve a hand. You're right. I want to finish um, with a quote, one of my favorite quotes from uh, President Teddy Roosevelt. It's not the critic that counts, not the man who points out where the strong man stumbles or the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred with dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes short again and again, because there is not effort without error and shortcomings, who does actually strive to do the deed, who knows the great devotion, the great enthusiasm, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who in the end, at best, knows the triumph of high achievement, and at the worst, if he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly, so that his place will never be with those cold and timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. We're all called to get in this fight. Some of you are already in it. For those of you teetering on the fence, I want to challenge you tonight. Don't make this just another talk that you go listen to. Let it move you. Step into the arena. 1.4 billion of our brothers and sisters are waiting for us to join them. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think he does deserve a little standing ovation. Ladies and gentlemen, we have time for questions and comments. If you raise your hand, one of our ambassadors in a gold shirt will come to you with a microphone. Um, please do use a microphone so that we can make sure everyone on the webcast hears it as well. So, what would you like to say? As we wait for a few people to get through. We have one in the back. Thank you. Hi, Jake, can you Hi. talk a bit more about... Sorry, sorry, before, would you mind saying your names too? I, would, I like to get to know Yes, people. absolutely, thanks. Yeah. Hi, Jake, I'm Hi. Katie. Hi, Katie. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, as you talk about the glass ceiling and the problem of kind of working hard to get there but not breaking through, can you s elaborate more about what's stopping the breakthrough and how you're doing things differently with Nuru? Sure, no problem. I think part of it is... Um, there's a real, there's a very, very strong paradigm in the aid industry uh, about the way things have been done for a very long time. The aid industry has been along for at least 50 years. And in those 50 years, we've put a, a, approximately $2.3 trillion into Africa with, with not a whole lot to show for it uh, in sustainable development. I think that has bred an aid industry, an aid mentality. Whole in, a whole industry has been created around this around aid and, and development, which means jobs have been created around the aid industry, thousands of jobs. I think one of the challenges of this is that we have the wrong mentality. The job of me and my team, if Nuru International is around in 20 years, I and my team have failed miserably. If I'm not out of a job in 20 years, I'm wrong. And I think everyone needs to have the same attitude about this fight. Our job is not to alleviate poverty, our job is to end poverty. And I think uh, that mentality, we need to encourage other people, other players in the sector to really adopt that, tech, that, that mentality. And there are people right now who are saying that. I have seen a shift in the last year about leading thinkers starting to, to talk about that. But it's gonna take, it's gonna take a lot of well-proven, successful models that are doing sustainable bottom-up development as an alternative to the way aid has been done in the last 50 years. Does that answer your question? Sure, absolutely, yes, no, no problem. So uh, we focus on uh, leadership. We don't focus on infrastructure development. So we really focus hardcore in capacity building, um, first of all. Second of all, we don't go in with uh, prefabricated solutions like I talked about. We really try to do a process of co-creation where we do bottom-up 
grassroots development in designing solutions using kind of cutting edge design methodology uh, that I learned at Stanford and some other places other, other organizations are doing that we're applying in the field now. Um, we also have, are, are very rigorous with this financial sustainability engine, the diversified scalable business, uh, businesses that we are building to fund the project after we're going. We're actually creating a new type of business, a new type of social enterprise that's a hybrid for-profit, non-profit entity that we have some uh, really great lawyers from Silicon Valley helping us draft, uh, you know, kind of shareholder agreements and, and documents of incorporation such, uh, such that we can have a legal entity that ensures, properly incentivizes the entrepreneurs growing the companies, but also ensures that the majority of the profits always go to the nonprofit side, always go to the impact programs that are being built um, for truly lasting sustainability. And the other, I'd say the last thing that we do is, uh, two more things, sorry. One is, we like to admit when we're wrong and tell people about it. Put it on our website, send it out in our newsletter, hey, we screwed up. I think that's really important. If we're ever going to arrive at a solution, we have to be willing to be humble and be willing that we make mis uh, to let people know we make mistakes. And, and trust me, I made a lot of them. Uh, but it's important to learn from those mistakes. If you can't admit when you're wrong, then you're never going to be able to iterate to arrive at the right solution. And I think that's, that's a real key. And the last thing I'd say is we always challenge assumptions. Don't be afraid to fail and don't be afraid to challenge the status quo and challenge assumptions. Just because something's been the, done the same way for 10 years in the industry doesn't mean it's necessarily the right way or the best way, the most efficient way. So we try to, we try to adopt kind of a startup mentality from Silicon Valley, you know, to try to challenge the paradigm that exists. Is that better? That's, that's great. Thank okay. you. Other questions? In the middle there. We've got two. Go. Go, go, go. Thank you. Sorry, guys. I see a bunch of hands. I'm waiting for the microphones to go around. Yeah. Hi, Jake. Um, Hi. I'm Katrina. I'm from Kingwood, your hometown. So hey. we're close to your hometown. Great. Um, and we're happy to have you back tonight. Thank you. Um, you talk a lot about leadership and how it's key to your organization and your mission. And you've talked a little bit about the types of leadership that you're looking for on the field. Um, can you explain a little bit more about the characteristics you're looking for in leaders, not just in your field, but also for folks who might want to help your organization? Sure. That's a fantastic question. Um, I believe passionately in a uh, type of leadership I come across called servant leadership. So my whole adult life has been about leadership, and I made a lot of mistakes as a leader, but I've learned a lot of really hard lessons about leadership, and the most effective model I've ever come across is servant leadership. It's a very simple model. You're putting your, your people before yourself in all things. You're focusing on serving your community. You're focusing on serving your people. That's the mentality you have. You're humble. You're authentic. You lead by example. Never ask your people to do something you wouldn't do yourself. Don't be afraid to get your hands dirty. These are the leadership principles that we um, train our team on on the ground, expats and local leaders. I mean, I've learned a lot about servant leadership from the, from the leaders that I work with, like Milka, in the community. And uh, so we try to identify the existing servant leaders and also build into the capacity of other leaders that we hire, focusing on servant leadership principles. Hi, Jake. My name's Elisa, and uh, I'm going to be retiring in a couple years. And I truly believe when you say we all are, need to be in this, but I hate to say it, probably after I leave here, I'm just going to go home. I, I live in Preston County, by the way. That's great. And, yeah, I love it. But I'm not going to go to Africa. My old body just won't go there. <laughs> so what I want to know is, you know, say we all need to be in it. Well, it just seems like a stretch to me. Yeah. And I feel like I need a little bit more guidance on that. I'd really like to do something, I think. Yeah. And I like what I hear you saying, but I don't know how to connect to it yeah, as an individual. So sure. what can you tell me? Sure, that's a great question. And I'm sorry I didn't bring that up earlier. Uh, some possible ways you get in to the fight with, uh, with us or others. Uh, a couple things. Number one is learn everything you can about what's out there. Uh, try to learn from, about other organizations. There's a lot of good organizations other than Nuru that are already in the fight too. Learn about these organizations. Find out what cause specifically you're passionate about. In fighting extreme poverty, there's a lot of different specific uh, 
causes you can get involved in. You know, some people focus on disaster relief and humanitarian aid. Some focus on community development like we do. There's lots of different ways you can get different programs out there. So find where your passion lines up with. Make sure they're sustainable and scalable and they're really creating impact. Study up on that. And then there's a lot of ways you can help. So like for a young organization like us, <laughs> you know, we, we are young. I have a small team. I'm always in Africa. Nobody knows who we are. Nobody knows who I am. You know, so one of the challenges that we have, if we want to scale globally and mobilize the capital and the people that we need to in order to reach that kind of level of scale, we have to have help getting out the word about who we are. So one of the best ways you can, do, you can help, have a little home gathering at your home. Invite your friends. You know, um, invite one of our speakers to come talk in your, in your home. Or even, you know, learn a lot about, about what Nuru is doing and share that with your friends in a little home gathering like that. It can be just awareness, or you can even do a little fundraiser. You know, um, I've had a lot of friends get involved on the fundraising side. They run a marathon for Nuru. They do a bike trip across the country or something for Nuru. They bake cookies and sell lemonade for Nuru. There's lots of ways to get involved, you know, with the fundraising and awareness side. If we have lots and lots of people who are doing little things like that, if we're all in it together, like, major change can happen. Look, I was a poor kid from West Virginia who was a Marine. If I can make a change... Anybody can make a change. Um, for those who are in college or in grad school, I encourage them to, to take courses, get degrees that are re relevant for this field if they do want to be on the front lines. And you know, groups like us hire folks like that and put them in the field to be able to use their technical expertise because we need good brains to meet the good brains of the people who are already in the community to help, help bring a solution together with them. You know? um, and there's also research that can be done. We, we, uh, we really focus hard on staying on the cutting edge of innovation in this field, and we do that a lot through volunteers who re do research for us. So that's another way that, that you can get involved. So there's lots of ways that, that people can get involved. Oh, and sorry, one more thing, too, that's really helpful. If you're on Facebook or Twitter, please face tweet or whatever you call it about, about <laughs> Nuru, okay? That's, that's like super helpful, uh, you know, in spreading the word, especially on college campuses and high schools and in and, uh, and, and the workplace, so that's a few things. More what else? More questions. Fantasia. Oh, um, I just had a question. Well, first of all, first of all, I'm Janae. Janae, um, okay. And I just had a question about the education. I'm asking because I grew up in a family with two parents that were engineers, so I kind of know the way your mind may work a little bit and the way my mind has worked is that, like, I saw um, with educating children, you teach them to write and to read, and that's good, but is there a component that teaches them art and to be creative? Because like that's the language that kind of transcends sometimes languages. Mm -hmm. And in areas of poverty, sometimes that's the way their minds work. It's like they imagine things and are really creative. So is there something tapping into that? That's a great idea, and I think you should start an organization to do just that. <laughs> we don't uh, do specifically art education for kids, but you're exactly right. Creativity, encouraging kids in creative ways um, in their education is extremely important. Uh, one of the things we do in, in teaching kids how to, uh, uh, in increasing literacy levels in children, is we use a lot of experiential learning. So they do a lot of drawing and a lot of, um, a lot of crafts in the process of teaching them how to read more effectively. Um, so we try to get pretty innovative in, in the types of training that we do in our lesson plans for literacy training. But I'm sure there's a lot more innovation that could be done, which you sound like a great start for that, so. What more else? More questions? So we're all over the place. Go ahead. Oh, Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Hi, my name is Spencer. Hi, um, Spencer. Besides, like, capacity building and grassroots efforts, does Nuru have some kind of philosophy on a larger scale with um, wealth inequality uh, between the global north and global south and in kind of multilateral initiatives to kind of combat the larger issue? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So um, we're, we, at Nuru, we're a bottom-up grassroots development approach. However, we also know that, that to solve this problem global, globally, it's going to require partnership between top-down initiatives and bottom-up initiatives. So when I was first starting Nuru, I saw a gap in the market, uh, specifically in failed states and conflict zones. So there was a lot of, you know, anytime there was a military intervention, regime change, what, what not, there was very little economic development that was done. All that infrastructure was ripped out of the country and the people that suffered the most were the people 
at the bottom in extreme poverty. It created a really ripe recruiting field for any kind of extremist uh, movement that was going in there. So NGOs that tried to do that work uh, usually experienced a lot of security issues and then they would have to pull everybody out of the country. Um, I think uh, military that tried to do that work, you know, the guys were trained to do military operations. They were not trained to help farmers increase crop yields. So I thought Nuru provided a good hybrid um, that could actually plug in there with my, my and others in my organization's security operations background combined with the economic development of the Nuru model. I feel like we have a unique ability to, to fit in that gap and help uh, top-down public policy, economic reform initiatives, and military interventions work hand-in-hand -hand to do effective kind of nation building okay, um, at a global level. So we do see a bigger vision for what we want to do and where we want to be in the sector once we prove our model and start scaling it. Does that answer your question? Fantasia over here on the left. Jake, two, a uh, couple of things. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Um, and um, I, uh, first question, I guess, I know I'm kind of limited, but uh, did, I was here last year when you guys did a, a presentation over at Medical with like one of your representatives. Oh, cool. Um, and my question is, did you guys go into Somalia and Sudan yet? And my other question is, do you use like Monsanto seed? Okay, so I'll answer your second question first, no. To answer your first question, we are also no. <laughs> We're not in Somalia or Sudan yet. So we have a strategy to be in failed state and conflict zones um, eventually, but the new room model is a different approach. We have to prove the model in a relatively stable area first um, before we introduce more, uh, more factors of volatility to the model, which would be in a failed state. So that's still a couple of years out. We need, to, we need to, our model to hit proof of concept first. We're thinking one and a half to two years before that would happen. Hello, Jake. Um, thank you for a really, really stimulating presentation and very relevant today. Um, I have a question about the communities where you work or with whom you work, and particularly inequalities within those communities, whether it be eth different ethnicities or gender or age, and what are some of the kind of bigger challenges around that with the work that you do, um, and how can you overcome some of these inequalities? And then just a very small second question. You might have mentioned that, but I didn't catch it. What does Nuru mean? Yeah, it's a good question. I'm sorry I didn't hit that before. Start with that one because it's really easy. Um, so Nuru in Kiswahili means light or hope. It means light, but in a lot of really rural areas, they also, it's also um, associated with hope. So I thought it was pretty relevant. We wanted to build a name that was re very relevant to the people that we were working with. So your first question about inequalities in the communities that we work in, there's a lot of inequality, and, and a lot of it is around um, women. So women are horribly oppressed in the areas that we work in in Kenya, less so in Ethiopia, but definitely in Kenya. Domestic violence is a terrible, terrible problem. Polygamy, um, it's, it's a pretty bad situation. And as I mentioned before, you know, Milka's situation where she was beaten pretty horribly when I first, when I first met her. The funny thing is, is not, not funny, but the really happy thing is, um, five years later, when Milka's in charge of 500 farmers, her husband follows her around like a little puppy dog. Like, he's just happy to be associated with Milka at this point. She has so much power and influence in that community at this point. It's, uh, it's very impressive. And, you know, Nuru doesn't do overt women empowerment as a program because we'll never get our foot in the door in these communities. However, we covertly, or we work very, very hard to empower women in our, in our communities that we work because statistics show that women empowerment is one of the keys to sustainable economic community development. You know, if you can uh, increase the disposable income in a household, if you give that money to, to a woman, uh, the data shows that there, it's way more likely to go to uh, health services for the kids or go to education for the kids so they can go to school, things like that. So we do fight the inequalities in the community. Another way that we do that is through our servant leadership training and facilitation in, in our methodology and process and curriculum. You know, we work really hard to train and equip servant leaders so that they will serve anybody in the community, you know, whether they're from a different clan, different gender, different age group. Um, though our leaders serve everybody equally across the board, and we hold them to that strict standard. If they do not hold, hold to that standard, they're quickly terminated. So, is that your question? In the center there. 
You answered a question a couple minutes ago about how adults could help, and I was wondering what I could do to help. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> What's your name? Alex. Alex, what high school? Or do you, or sorry, what school do you go to? Suncrest Middle School. Okay, great. I love that question because, yeah, give her a hand. You know, um, kids, I believe that the real change is going to happen in our world today when the youth of today can really rally around this problem and get involved to help solve it. We have a lot of kids who help us at Nuru. And um, we have kids at their school. Uh, if you go online, there's a video about what they did at Fairmont High School. They had a Nuru week where they had like... Uh, a funny hat day where they all designed Nuru hats and wore them around and kind of raised money through by selling these hats. They did a little run around the campus that they raised money with. They were all kind of really neat ideas that they had. They, they sold little bracelets, stuff like that. So um, there's a lot of stuff you can do to help spread awareness. And you know, folks like you, you know, people people like me are are kind of stupid. We don't even know what Facebook is, right? But you're like a genius on Facebook. You can. You can spread the word to your five million friends on Facebook <laughs> just by saying you came to tonight's event. You know, you have a lot of power in, in ways that you can influence Nuru's ability to fight extreme poverty. So please help. Okay. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, thank you. What's up, Jake? Uh, my name's Jake, too. Actually, I was just wondering if you hey, had any, up? like, particularly rewarding experience, like one moment where you just said, you know, this is like, this is what I'm here for, this is why I'm doing it. Could you talk about that? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, I've had a lot of those, uh, to be honest with you. I talk to, when I, I, I do a lot of talks sometimes about uh, the other side. You know, people ask me a lot about the challenges and, and I talk about this thing called the get out of bed factor because uh, there's some days where I just, you know, I just don't want to get out of bed. You know, I've had like, I've reviewed the farmer list. I see lines through. This is after the first season. I saw these lines through the roster, through names. And I asked my buddy Andrew Senda, the guy, the Kenyan guy running the program, hey, hey man, what, why did you line out these names? He's like, hey, they, they died. You know, they died. They, they, they had malaria or they, you know, uh, they, were, they starved to death or there were several reasons the farmers had died. And, you know, you have a day like that, you don't want to get out of bed, right? Because these farmers, like, were my friends. You know, like I, it was a very small group of them that I was working with in the beginning. So you have days like that where you just don't want to get out of bed. So but you have to have that reason for why you got into the fight. You have to have that cause in your gut that gets you up every morning, that makes you, that motivates you and inspires you to keep going. You can never give up. This fight's extremely challenging. And you can never give up. And the, and the moments that you talk about, that you ask me about, are the ones that keep me going, too. Moments like Milka coming up to me in the field and telling me, basically telling me what to do. And she's, she's in desperate poverty right now. She, doesn't, she didn't say, give me money. What do you have for me? She said, I need you to listen to me. You know, I need you to, to sit your white butt down here and you listen to me. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I did. You know, and, and times like that, where she teaches me things like that, inspire me. They keep me going. You know, um, times in the field... When I'm walking in villages that, that had many mud huts with thatch, old thatch that was, that was wasting away and causing the kids inside to get sick because the rain was coming through. A year later to go back to those same villages and see brick houses with metal sheeting because they, those families have money and they can build a permanent structure now. Moments like that, just, I mean, they're so rewarding. You know, or hearing about, hearing about one of our farmers who, when I first met him, couldn't even put clothes on his children. Three years later, all of his girls, girls, all of his girls, he's paying for them all to be in high school. You know, that's a, that's a true success story. You know, and, and it's, it's stories like that, it's, I mean, I'm all getting excited now, you know, like just thinking about those things, you know, like so, I, I the highs in this job are so high. I mean, it's like, I, I can't even describe to you the kind of experiences that I'm able to have I'm so thankful to be a part of in this work and seeing that kind of transformation and inspiration. With that, I think we are going to end our program tonight. Thank you all so very much. Thank you to Jake. <laughs>